Welcome in to the Lucas and Lucas podcast. Lucas Frank alongside Mike Lucas, where Mike continues his postseason betting heater. Another perfect weekend for you. Just want to say congratulations. And I wish I knew what the feeling was like to have a, a great weekend picking games in the NFL. Thank you. Thank you. I doubled down on the Niners with a little halftime live bet. On the money line or, or plus the On point? the money line. Yep. That cash three to one was nice. So uh, we're feeling good going to Super Bowl Sunday, even though I know we're a week and a half away. But Frank, we have to start with the obvious. You can't avoid it. I am 2-0 and in my last two picks, and you're 1-1, one one, so that clearly makes it the Lucas and Lucas show is now the Mike Lucas and Lucas Frankel show, not the opposite. So <laughs> let's, get into our, let's get into our first topics today with that in mind. This is now my show, and you're the sidekick. Well, if, you, well, if, you wanna, if you're saying let's get into our topics, then technically you would be the one who's choose which direction we go to in terms of the, the show, but I, it looks like that's my decision, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead on that. Actually, you know what? Let's start with Ben Simmons, Frank, because I know that's really what – Really, what's it? No, I'm kidding. Let's start with the Raiders. No, 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 no. You know, you're right because I am so ecstatic after Ben Simmons returned <laughs> on Monday night for the Brooklyn Nets. First game since November 6th, missed 39 games. And you know what happened, Mike? They scored a season high 147 points in 18 minutes. Ben Simmons only played 18 minutes, five of five from the field, did not miss a shot. Grant, everything was probably like a bunny near the rim, but perfect from the field 10 points, 11 assists, eight rebounds, a game high plus 27. You in 18 minutes, and that's outscored the Jazz by 27 points. These two teams played not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago in Utah. Grand, you the Nets, I don't think ever played well in Utah, but in that game, they got smoked. The Nets lost 125 108. So they they basically got the doors blown off there by the by the Jazz in that game. And then Ben Simmons comes back and they look like an, an incredible team. I'm telling you, Mike. And and, and the unfortunate reality of the situation is you can't count on Ben Simmons because. Next game he plays, he's probably going to get hurt his back again somehow, and he'll, be, he'll miss another you know two months before we see him again. But he is the missing link to this team. The way the offense was flowing with him out there, it was like a 180 compared to what we were seeing without him. The, the fast break is it's a whole different animal. The motion, the movement, everything just clicks when he's there. He is the glue to this team, and I, I just know I can't count on it, but when he's there, they're easily a top six or seven team in the East. Yeah, it's, it's actually shocking that a guy who is so limited in his skill set and he can't shoot. Like Ben Simmons is a guy who plays eight feet and in. He is the he same. Did, no, 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 no. He doesn't shoot. I believe he can shoot. He but, does not. Um, shoot. But I'm saying right now, maybe he can, but he doesn't. So his offensive game is eight feet and in. He has the same offensive game as essentially prime DeAndre Jordan. Like that's honestly about it in terms of scoring. In terms but, of scoring. Yeah. But it, what everything else he does, he, when, when he plays, and granted, as you said, and you're right, is very infrequent. Not this dude is not on the court all the time. He's an elite passer. He's a phenomenal rebounder from the wing position. Defensively, he's not where he was back in Philadelphia, where he was first team All NBA defense. But he's a six eight, six nine, strong, athletic wing that at least provides some sort of resistance. And the Nets play stagnant offensively. They don't run a ton without him. They try to, but he's one of the best fast break. Uh, initiator, initiators and facilitators in basketball because of his ability to get a defensive rebound and lead the break himself. And that's where he's best in the open court. Ben Simmons, and this is why, no matter how frustrating of a player he is because he's never on the court, there's always going to be that infatuation with him because there are very few players in the NBA, Frank, that have that skill set and that ability to affect the game with only taking five shots. And Ben Simmons has his flaws. By no means a perfect player and... His reliability is the same as a parachute with a hole in it jumping off a, the skyscraper. Like, you just can't count on the guy. But when he plays, it's impossible to ignore the impact he makes on not just not just them on one side of the ball, but on both, and he makes other players better. He's a good player when he's healthy. He's just never healthy. His point prop for Monday night's game was three and a half points. I, I couldn't believe it. I haven't, <laughs> it's embarrassing. I haven't bet in a while. For, for certain reasons, but when I it was minus one thirty eight, but like I thought that was just truly free money. free money. Granted, they knew he was gonna be on a minutes restriction, but three and a half points on that was truly laughable. And I do believe that he is like he's a. I know you're sort of like diminishing like what he is at this point, but like I I, I thought that was the. One of the best games I've like th that was the most joyful I've been watching Ben Simmons play. I thought the way that he orchestrated that offense 
in that game was like it was a work of art like the way that he was distributing uh rebounding everything it yeah. was a, it was a complete perform it was like and and what's and what's and what sucks about it is that you know it's not you know when, when he's out there and healthy like it's gonna be great but like we said he's gonna play 14 games a year but if he if he can stay healthy the rest of the way like they're they're gonna be you know a, a six or seven seed in the east and and, and maybe they can even win a playoff round. I think that's a ceiling for this team with Ben Simmons. And, uh, the East, have, and in terms of big picture on this team, I think Dorian Finney-Smith is such trash. I, I trade is, him. He yeah. is so bad. And and I maybe you can get like a, a late first round pick for him, but I, I don't I don't like he anything he does or brings to the table. He is a below average offensive player. I guess he's a maybe a decent defensive player, but I, I can't stand Dorian Finney-Smith. And I can't stand Spencer Dinwiddie. If the Nets could figure out a way to get those two players off the team, that'd be a huge win. And I know those are guys, those are the guys that got back in the, in the Kyrie trade, but I, I hate both of them. I think they're my two least favorite players on the team. I mean, I I don't know if I hate either one of them, but they have replica replicable replicable skills to some of the other guys on the team. They're not necessary key cogs. The thing with Simmons, Frank, and I, I think about this, and this is what I go back to when you think of what Simmons could be and why. He still has some sort of value in the league. If you were playing pickup, right, and you're at a random church or a random gym, and you got a guy like Ben Simmons on your team, you're the happiest dude in the gym. You have a guy who doesn't need the ball a lot, is looking to pass, rebounds, plays defense, and they, everyone wants to play with that guy. Like, like I'm serious, and, and and I know it's that's simplifying it to its its most basic form, but in today's day and age where Everyone could score 20 points and everyone wants shots and there's only so many shots to go around. I know the pace is up and teams are scoring more than ever, but like there is just a finite number of shots that, that occur in a 48-minute 48, uh, 48 game. A guy like Ben Simmons who is willing to do the dirty work, what he does is not the easy stuff. Like he does the stuff that other people don't want to do. Like Cam Thomas doesn't play defense, doesn't pass, doesn't rebound. He's the opposite of Ben Simmons. They are completely opposite. Like you combine them, that's the MVP of the league. But like... He does all the little dirty work that makes winning teams function as cohesively as they can. And when he's on the court, he makes everyone else's job easier. And he gets the more open looks. He's a great passer. Like, we talk about guys who are good versus great. Like, Ben Simmons is a great passer. His floor vision is top-notch. Like, top, top-notch. And you can just see how many more easy and I didn't watch the game live at the Cavs game last night. They beat the Clippers. So I watched by the way, the- by the way, Cavs highest team in the league, 10 of the last 11 games. Yeah. I mean, my God, they look like an absolute juggernaut. But you know they you know the Cavs are gonna lose in the first or second round because Donovan Mitchell cannot get over the hump. Well, I'll give we'll get back to that in a sec. But the thing with Simmons, like I didn't see it live, so I went back and watched the the, the quick cut highlights. That's what I was saying. They had more open looks than I could remember them getting in any game. And granted, they, they made a ton of shots last night. But how many easy freaking looks did they have, Frankel? Like every possession down the court. Yeah, that's they what were I was saying. It, it, was a, it, was a complete, it was a complete 180 in what we've been seeing. It was compared like the, the, the past like two months of Nets basketball has been just a tough, tough watch because everything's been nothing's been easy for them to do offensively. Yeah. But last night it just looked so easy. It looked so easy the way they were just the way Clax like Claxton offensively just looked like an absolute like monster. And they were the way he was like attacking the rim and and Mikhail Bridges was getting looks and and every and Cam Johnson was and, playing was playing good. Everything it was everything was just clicking. We haven't and, seen and that. to piggyback off that, Frank, like you look at the Nets roster, take Simmons out the picture, right? They don't really have a traditional point guard. Right, exactly. And, and that's which is why he's the glue that holds the team together. And and all their players, as good as Mikhail Bridges is, and Cam Johnson, and some of these other guys, like they're not creators to the level of a Luca KD like they're, they're not elite creators they're all kind of twos who are being asked to play up a level because they don't have that legit number one guy so what makes their job so much easier a guy that gets them open looks they're not going iso every time I, I know we laugh because Simmons has played what was the 11th game of the season if that is it? I believe this is something Sixth? like seventh game Wh- whatever it is like he's never on the court and he's frustrating and they you know he was the piece in the hardened trade they got back and I understand the allure of Ben Simmons. It sucks that he's never healthy, but when he is, he is still an impact player in the NBA today. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, no question about it. But let's let's shift gears to the National Football. Yep. Let's start with the NFC game. And I'm still, I'm like, I'm usually, I usually don't feel like this about games that I'm not a fan of and or my team's not in. But man, I that game I, hurt you. I could tell. I the Lions lost like, I. 
like, granted, the grand scheme of things doesn't really affect me at all, but I just like, because I, I, I predicted Chiefs Lions in the Super Bowl, and I feel like I got robbed of that because Dan Campbell got so reckless with his coaching and calls, and just two pl- there were two plays in that game that if one of them goes a different way, the Lions win that game. The Brennan IU catch that should have been intercepted, that ended up in his arms in the red zone, and then the Gibbs fumble right after they scored, the 49ers did on the ensuing drive. Those th- those two plays changed the IU catch changed the whole game. And then they had two opportunities to take a double digit lead. The Lions did, and they opted to go for it four times on fourth down, missed them both. And it was just the completely reckless coaching by Dan Campbell, comp- not recognizing the situation. You go up 17 points in the third quarter in the NFC championship game. Like you can't ask for a better situation to be in. Instead, he chose to stay up by 14 and, it just, it just really bothered me because they, they they the Lions should be in the Super Bowl right now and because of the IU catch and questionable coach extremely questionable out of out of line coaching calls in my in my mind they are not and if Dan Campbell was in like his fifth or sixth year coaching the Lions there was no question he'd be fired no question but because it was his you know second year on the job and you know they've had right. they've had in so long there's this feeling of, oh, it's Dan Campbell, like he's building something, so he gets to stick around longer. But if he, if he had been there a little bit longer, Mike, I'm telling you, there'd be so much more scrutiny and this wouldn't be flying. So a couple of things that I want to – we had Joe Flack on the show today and we asked him about this, and he had a great answer. So I want to end with that. Don't let me forget. But Dan Campbell all season in his three years, third year – I know he's been years. aggressive, but I don't want to hear. I, I don't no, no, care. but just, I don't care. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm painting the picture to come back. Had made his mantra on being aggressive. That would that, That's his thing. He's fully bought into the analytics of going forward, the seven over three mantra, all that. I think, and then Joe Flacco said on, on UCSS today, the Oakland Sports Show, we asked about analytics, what he thought about Dan Campbell going for it. And he's like, as a player, yeah, you always want to go for it because you're the most confident guys in the field. Like You get that. But when you step back and look big picture, these analytics, and I'm a fan of analytics. I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you what he said. Analytics paint a picture of, 250 scenarios from all across the league and jam it into one number. And what that one number doesn't take into consideration is, is this a 13 and 14 going forward on fourth and two against a bad team? Is this a two and 17, a two and 15 team going forward on fourth and two? Cause they're down. Like th- there's more context to these numbers. And I, I go back and I think of each of the three decisions that Dan Campbell made to go for it. And obviously in hindsight, they all, they all didn't work. The one that I, the two that I have the biggest issue with, was not kicking a field goal to make it 27-27. And granted, I understand all the Badgley numbers. He's not great from uh he's not great from 45 yards. He's nine for 20 in his career from 40 from 48 plus. It was a 48 yarder. The Lions were 15 of 20 this season on fourth and three. The actual numbers say they had a higher percentage of getting it had they gone for it on fourth and three as opposed to kicking it based on the percentages. But my thing is if you don't trust your kicker to make a 48 yarder in decent field conditions, what why is he on your team? And they cut Riley Patterson, who came to the Browns in week 17. And you still don't trust the guy you brought in? I, I have a question with that. In that case, I would have wanted to tie the game, got some sort of momentum, at least back on your side, because it was all trending in San Francisco's side. But the biggest call I had with Dan Campbell, Frank, was running it on third and one at the goal line. That was my biggest issue he made the entire game, was running on third and one because you had to use a timeout afterwards when you decided to go for it on fourth down. And then you only had two timeouts. So you're putting your entire fate on an onside kick which is essentially non-existent anymore in today's NFL after they changed the rule. So of all the fourth down decisions, I think there's total uh, validity in criticizing them. And each one, I think, is to uh, analyze individually. But the third down run attempt with David Montgomery on the goal line, that was my biggest qualm with what Dan Campbell did on Sunday. That's fair. I mean, so this goes, I also go back to the Cowboys game earlier in the year. I believe that was week 17 or week – I believe it was week 17. It was a Saturday night game where they had they, – they, they attended like three or four two-point conversions. The ineligible receiver that then got the called back to the like, offsides. Yeah. Like, it, it comes to a point where, like, just just kick the extra point and go to over. Like, it was just so – like, and, and the, the biggest point was, like, when, you, when, you, when you're in those two-point situations, like, you do your best plays, like, first. And when you're on your third or fourth try, like, you're on, like – it's like the saying in baseball, you want to be beat with your best pitch, not your fourth best pitch. And yeah. and they had to rely on their fourth best pitch, and they and of course it didn't work because you're throwing you're not throwing your best pitch in that situation. So like and then, and then the NFC Championship game, it was like the same thing. So like I'm telling you, Mike, it, if he keeps this up, and listen, I I understand it's his mantra of you know I'm aggressive, I'm aggressive, but it's already cost him one year. Like how many more times can the Lions can Dan Campbell afford to have this mentality 
where it he's going to be safe in this job. I'm, it's it's going it, to he's got to realize in certain situations that it's okay to adjust your thinking at certain times. And if he well, does, you 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 get one like you get one. Okay, that is what it is. Now it'll be interesting to see does Dan Campbell adapt that all to maybe be a little more conservative or does he lean full in? We saw Brandon Staley, the the former Chargers coach, who's interviewing at the Rams today was super aggressive and completely changed his mantra, and that kind of just threw off the whole, I don't say psyche of the team, but he was aggressive, 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 and was the most passive coach in football. I can't imagine Dan Campbell doing that. But I do think it'll be interesting to see uh, at some point, because if you're, if you're the Lions owner, like, I, I have a feeling an old-school owner isn't in love with those decisions to go forward on fourth down, no matter how much you like Dan Campbell. He got the one pass. All right, Dan, you did it your way. Didn't work. Now let's see what the happy medium is. You can't go full turtle, but maybe you don't have to go full throttle every single time either. So yeah, well, we'll see we'll see what happens there going forward, but the that, you know, the early like Grand Alliance have like like I said, one of the most They also dropped real quick. Josh Reynolds also dropped two passes on fourth down that had he caught changed the whole complexion of the game. So we could argue all we want about Dan Campbell should he or should not have. Catch the damn ball, and this is not a conversation. So the, the Lions haven't been in an NFC title game in over 30 years, so like, it's kind of like there's a, there's a certain leeway that he has because the Lions haven't haven't been in this situation in so long. But I assume I grant, and, and there's no and there's no guarantees next year because Kirk Cousins is. We'll see if he's back with. I believe he's going to be back with the Vikings, so he'll be healthy coming off his torn Achilles. The Packers, you know, Jordan Love, you know, it seems like they're they're going to be one of the highest ascending teams in the league, you know, because they they got a great cast of uh playmakers on the offensive side of the ball with Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, and Aaron Jones and AJ. Like they're 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 they they loaded. Have, they have a great foundation. Uh the Bears, if you know if they are gonna be a big problem in that division too. So like as as Dan Campbell eloquently stated post game, like you don't know how many opportunities you're gonna get. And the, the NFC North is going to be extremely competitive. You told me right now the Lions miss the playoffs next year. Like that's certainly plausible. They're not in my mind they're they're it's not like this is uh you know the, just the beginning for the Lions. Um yeah. just because just because of how difficult that conference is and how great their division is, especially if the Bears do what they have to, should do and take Caleb Williams. Um, so it's going to be – he's scheduled an Brand Staley interviewing with the, the Rams on Wednesday is the latest. Um, but, I mean, Brand Staley and Dan Campbell, I think, have similar philosophies, and that those philosophies have ended up backfiring big time for both coaches. So uh, just something to watch going forward. The Chiefs are going back to the Super Bowl, and Grand – I was highly skeptical of the Chiefs being able to do this because, in my opinion, this is the worst Mahomes team that he's had since entering the league. Uh, they have, I mean, aside from aside from Kelsey, in terms of who they're throwing the ball to, like, I I, I can't, I, I don't remember ever like. That's why I was so skeptical of them making this run. But I'm t- them getting to face the Dolphins in round one in the cold in Arrowhead was the best thing that could have happened. It, it was the worst situation for the Dolphins, who were so banged up, had no no mojo at all going in that game. And the Chiefs were able to sort of regain some confidence and have just sort of built on that going forward. And that, and that's why they're here, because it's freaking Patrick Mahomes. Unbelievable. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. He is, without a question, the best quarterback in the league. There's no close second. And no. um, he's inevitable. He's, a, he's on a tier of his own. The way he came out, and I know they didn't score in the second half. I, I get all that. But the way he came out in the first half, 10 for 10 in the first quarter, put the onus on Lamar Jackson to almost match him pass for pass was the knockout blow. I feel like they punked the Ravens, and the Ravens were never able to recover. And for all the, the, the talk and the hype and the praise Lamar Jackson, rightfully so, has received for his performance in the regular season, there's legitimately a track record now, Frankel, of Lamar Jackson and – I was in belief of this beforehand. This was confirmation bias on Sunday. I just don't trust him in the playoffs. Like, if he has to throw the ball to beat me, I'm okay. And he missed, I know, uh, Zay Flowers. He could have had better numbers, but Flowers fumbled on the, the one-yard line. Great play by Jerry Sneed. But he missed a ton of guys in that game. And that interception, likely, situationally speaking, was horrendous. Like, you can't make that throw. Uh, he had some throws to the left sideline. He overthrew OBJ once. He overthrew Aguilar. He overthrew Duvernay, I think it was, but he had three on the left sideline. And I just, Lamar's a, I've compared him to James Harden before, but he really is James Harden of the NFL. He could have tremendous regular season success. I just don't trust him at all when it comes to the postseason. Yeah, another analogy I heard was Clayton Kershaw before he got over the hump. But yeah, 
It, it, it feels like, you know, him, him and Josh Allen are kind of like in that same boat. They can look. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. I, I got to stop that. Josh Allen against the same defense two weeks ago had three touchdowns, no turnovers, Fine. and had I, let his team I, down I, in a position to kick a field goal. His kicker shanked it. I mean, Lamar I mean, could have been, scored two touchdowns against this team. Yeah, but I, th- I think if Zay Flowers scores a touch, like if Zay Flowers just doesn't fumble, I think that game, that game is, 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 is it's a completely different game. Like the the Chiefs won by seven points, and and if Zay Flowers you know scores a touchdown, you know who knows how that game's different. I but I I, I understand Josh Allen's been playing better, but it just feels like those two guys in particular. Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Granted, Josh Allen has been great in the playoffs and has gotten extremely unlucky. I, I will, I recognize that, but it just feels like for whatever reason, Josh Allen can't get over the hump, and Lamar Jackson. It feels like you know when when backs are against the wall, it feels like he. And, and granted, maybe for whatever, maybe you can attribute it to luck too, because like the whole Zay Flowers thing, but. Man, it just you really start to question with you know in the AFC with you know because Joe Burrow and Mahomes I think are clearly the top two guys in that yeah. conference and there's a distant third and fourth for for Josh Allen and Lamar and, and and it feels like they've had such unbelievable opportunities to get to the Super Bowl both guys and they just yeah it seems like the world is just against them I I like I said I'll push back a little bit on the. Allen hasn't done enough. I think Lamar. I'm not, no, 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 no. I'm but, not but, saying but, that. But to, he, but to your point, he has done to, enough. To to the big point though, is there's there was an era of quarterbacks that just couldn't get past Tom Brady, and really good quarterbacks that will not have the historic careers that maybe their numbers suggest they should have, because they played in the same era as Tom Brady. And the same thing happened with Jordan in basketball. And there's going to be a lot of guys in the AFC right now. Josh Allen. Is, Josh Allen is Charles and, Barkley. And if if you want to put th- those guys in that category, Frank, I'm all for you. Like I, I I'm with you right there. I, I'm I'm all there with you. But Joe Burrow's slayed the dragon. He beat Mahomes in a playoff game in Arrowhead, made it to the Super Bowl, and his team was uh, on the fringe of winning a Super Bowl. So he's not in the same class as Mahomes. It is it is clearly Mahomes by himself, and then everyone else underneath. But there are going to be guys in the AFC, and mind Mahomes is in his seventh season, his sixth as a starter who are never going to get a chance to play in, in these games and these giant playoff moments and, and potentially Super Bowls because Mahomes is there for six, another decade, another decade and a half. And the Jets are in that conference, just a reminder. Believe me, I, listen, I'm aware. And, like, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is the reason. And Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady aren't the reason why the Jets have been a you know dumpster fire organization. It's It's – Everything, everything else that goes into it, and I, I just always was looking back at the 2021 draft today. I, I just wanted to see like who, who, who could the Jets have had aside from Zach Wilson, and they could have had one of the one of the three guys: Michael Parsons, Jamar Chase, or Penny Sewell. One of those three would have been just a complete game change. I, I would have loved. I, I believe at that time I was, if I remember correctly, I was pulling for Penny Sewell, and they didn't listen to me. And Penny Sewell is now like you. Were, wait, 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 wait. Going back, you were going to take. Uh, Someone other than a quarterback. I know Wilson wasn't your top choice at quarterback, but you were willing to listen to someone other than a quarterback. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was. If it wasn't, I believe. If I, I don't remember exactly what I was thinking in the moment. Maybe if you look back at my Twitter, you'll be able to, or X, you'll be able to tell what I was thinking in the moment. But I believe I was pulling for an offensive lineman. If I remember, I wanted them to. I believe I wanted them to keep Sam Donald and draft an old lineman and and do. Not that they would have been any different, and maybe they'd be in the same situation they are right now. But I just was. That, that, I believe that's what I was thinking in the moment. And it'd be so much better off if they had Penny Soul. But that's beside the point. So the Super Bowl rematch of Super Bowl 54, Chiefs, Niners, and I'm still not a believer in Brock Purdy. I don't know. Even if even if the Niners win the Super Bowl, I still don't believe I'll be a believer in Brock Purdy. I believe that, listen, he made plays. He made some plays in that in that game, but I believe that the Niners won that game much more due to the fact of the mistakes by the Lions and Dan Campbell's coaching and fair or unfair. I just Brock Purdy. I, I don't see any scenario where he wins. He's got to throw four touchdowns, no interceptions to win Super Bowl MVP. And I, I don't believe he's capable yeah. of doing that. And, and, and you got it. So yeah, if you're asking me who, who won the game, did the lions win it? Sorry. Did the lions lose it to the 49ers win it? The lions lost it a thousand times more than the 49ers won that game. And I really hope the Chiefs win because I want I need to be proven right on Brock Purdy and him winning the Super Bowl <laughs> would be a uh, a big knock against my credibility. Yeah, I mean it, it'll depend on how the game goes down. I I saw McCaffrey is the favorite of a 49er to win Super Bowl MVP. 
over the quarterback, which is, you know, typically not the way it goes. And I haven't done enough deep dive into the game to give a pick or anything yet, but I think the basic analysis, and I'm not going to say anything groundbreaking. Oh, sorry, no, it, it goes Mahomes plus 140, Purdy plus 200, McCaffrey plus 450. Oh, then what I saw today was just completely, and I saw it on Twitter. Well, I mean, if I mean, I mean, I'm sure at different sports books it might be. I'm just using the odds of FanDuel. That's all. Got gotcha. you. Well, FanDuel's a sponsor of my show, so I should be using FanDuel. I saw that on Twitter, but my my point is, you saw you saw it on X. I I refuse to give it its proper accreditation, but <laughs> big, big picture and like once again, this is not groundbreaking by any means. I have one quarterback that I trust with my entire life. Maybe the best quarterback that ever lived. Definitely the best quarterback in the NFL right now. Versus a quarterback, on the other hand, who I think is good, but I don't fully trust yet. And he had a bunch of throws against Detroit that could have been intercepted and weren't. And he, I know he came through in the clutch when it mattered, and he did the same against Green Bay the week before, but... Brock Purdy leaves a lot to be desired, and this Kansas City Chiefs defense is very good. So my initial gut is lean towards Kansas City just because at the most important position on the field, I have the utmost faith in the world on one side and not a whole lot of faith on the other. Yeah, I, I mean, what, I, what I really loved about the Chiefs game and against the Ravens was the way they came out in that opening drive. They really Mahomes set the tempo for the whole game, and, I, and it was like it was like that they they punched. Uh, the Ravens, and they were just reeling the rest of the game and never really able to recover. Yeah. And if, if the Chiefs can do that in the Super Bowl, just – just and then listen, even if they're down by 14, 17, 21 points, like Mahomes is never out of a game, so I don't believe – even if the Niners do strike first, but I believe it is so important for – it. I believe that if the Chiefs can come out and score on their opening drive like they did against the Ravens, I'm curious, I'm very curious to see how Purdy responds because Mahomes and Andy Reid are not going to make the same careless decisions and mistakes that Dan Campbell and the Lions did against the Niners. It's just, I just don't see it happening at all. That's how I swear. Well, That's Andy Reid's aggressive, but they trust their kicker, which is also you know part of the whole Dan Campbell thing is he clearly did not trust Michael Badgley. Harrison Bucker, I think, is the most accurate playoff kicker of all time, Frank. If my, if my memory serves correct on a stat I heard, I believe the most uh, – the most accurate, but either way, it, I'm really upset. People are, are upset that it's these same two teams that they've had before, and it's a rematch of 2020 and all that. Like, it's Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl against the coach and the team that's gotten close before and hasn't had a chance to come through. Like, I think this has storylines galore. Take out the extracurriculars of off field relationships and such. The on field product here is, in my opinion, the best team in the NFC, and it was way closer than I thought. They won. They're the best team in the AFC versus the best quarterback coach combo in the entire NFL. So I am, uh, I'm excited. And both conference championship games were great games of football, Frank. I think we're going to get another great Super Bowl. I'm, I'm I mean, it, I'm definitely excited for it. I hope the Chiefs win because, like I said, I can't, I can't have Brock Party win and ruin my credibility. By the way, I just, I was just looking at odds on FanDuel because I wanted to see if the line shifted it off of the game. And Caleb Williams is only minus 1,200 to be the number one overall pick. Granted, I mean that's not you know it's it's essentially no value there. But why isn't he like minus a hundred thousand? Oh no! Like I I I would like put my life savings on Caleb Williams minus twelve hundred and get a couple thousand dollars out. Like, what if he's not though? No wedding. I don't know. I'm I'm just surprised that's not that's not more. that should that should be minus like minus be, be, like minus fifty thousand or minus hundred thousand. But anyway, I just saw that. Anyway, last thing before we go, uh, Joel Embiid is. Likely to become the first player to become, or notable player in the potential right to be in the MVP race to become ineligible for MVP. Just what is what is your thought on that whole situation? Because he was on going to Saturday when he looked like he was going to play against the Nuggets. He was plus one seventy. He was the overall favorite to an NBA MVP. And now since he's missed the past couple games, he has dropped to plus four fifty behind Jokic and SGA. And if he misses six more games, he is ineligible for the award. So he had to play like 32 of the like the remaining 37 games. So if you're the Sixers, are you in a situation uh, and the Sixers play on Tuesday night and we don't know Embiid's status at the moment, but maybe he missed last night because of the back-to-back -back situation. But if you're the Sixers, are you just saying, screw the MVP for Embiid this year. We just need to hold healthy for the playoffs. I think that's the way you got to approach it. it. It is. So I like the premise of the idea that these guys have to play a certain number of games. Like I, I, I do believe there's some validity and the league had to do something to stop guys just taking nights off at any given time. But like I don't think the Sixers 
who have their entire playoff success hinging on the shoulders of Joel Embiid should be forced to play a guy through an injury just to be eligible for an award. And I understand he's got six games left. He wasn't on the injury report before Denver. He didn't play against Portland last night, uh, which threw off Eli's whole scout. But Portland ended up winning that game, so shout out to Eli. Uh, but in general, like, if a dude's hurt, a dude's hurt. And he has to miss games, he has to miss games. And if he missed too many games, yeah, you're probably not the MVP. Like, I do think there's validity to that. But I don't think you can, or you should, or any team should, force a guy to play for a regular season award when at the end of the day, all you're doing is chasing a championship. If you're the sixth seed and you know you can't win, like the Pacers, for example, and Tyrese Halliburton has to play to reach first-team All-NBA status, I'm a little more inclined to be like, all right, Tyrese, like, let's get you in there for two minutes and get you out so you can do this. But I don't think their ceiling's championship. If you're the Sixers, who I do think in a perfect scenario could win the NBA Finals, you can't risk Embiid getting hurt. And if his knee is sore, if you're going to believe what the reports say, then you can't play him. And it's a bummer because we missed the Jokic and Embiid rematch. But I'm not, I, I can't just force a player out there for the sake of winning a regular season award when my big time goal, my end goal is a NBA championship. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think the Sixers will ever win a championship with MB just because I, he sucks in the playoffs. Well, it doesn't, not that, but I just, I, he's not going to hold up for, you know, April, May for three straight months and not miss, not, he, he, the way he, he's, he's too reckless of a player, I think, to, to hold up for that period of time which is unfortunate as it is. And he hasn't played in Denver since 2019, I've said. I know, I know. He ducks it every time. So I, like, I don't know if that's it, like a, the air thing or he doesn't feel like, I don't, I mean, who knows what's going on there, but it's, it's bizarre, but yeah, MB, MB's not winning MVP and uh, it is what it is, but that will do it for this edition of the Lucas Lucas podcast. Next week, we'll dive into the more Super Bowl stuff. And maybe the Nets will continue winning with Ben Simmons. Who knows? Let's hope so.